Mass TLC Tech and Innovation Community is happy to present Cloud Cost Optimization, Building a Cost Aware Culture, featuring Gary Sloper, co-founder and managing partner of Macronet. Gary goes beyond simply lowering your costs and delves into the importance of a partnership between engineering and finance in the new role of FinOps. Thank you to our tech and innovation community sponsors, Chewy, Intersystems, Macronet, MIT Professional Education, and Progress. And thank you to the Mass TLC global sponsors who support us through everything we do for the entire year. Good morning. Welcome to today's presentation. My name is Gary Sloper. I'm with Macronet Services. I'm one of the co-founders and managing partners here. And I'm extremely excited and honored to be a guest uh, with Mass TLC today to talk about cloud cost optimization and building a cost aware culture. Uh, this is a, a topic that I think many of us in the industry face and have heard and have been asked. And what we wanted to do today is, is talk a little bit about where the industry is heading and, and hopefully this will resonate within your organization and generate some conversation that, that we can have here within uh, the Mass TLC to, to help you on your journey. So today we wanted to talk around cloud cost optimization and really the discussion overview is what is cloud cost optimization? Is it simply just lowering your bill? Uh, how do you benefit within the organization if your costs are high or low and how do you go around the best practices there? But really the end of the day, cloud cost optimization means something different to a lot of organizations. And you, what you're gonna hear is how that standard is becoming more known in the industry around FinOps. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means for you specifically and, and how you can take some tidbits away uh, and, and help within your organizations. But ultimately, there's opportunities to, to go after uh, additional cost control and governance. And there's strategies to lower OPEX today, but you really need to think about the, the longer term picture as you deploy applications or you go through an M&A process and how you assimilate uh, a multi-cloud strategy. So we'll talk a little bit about how to design, build, and, and run a cost-aware culture. And in our opinion, uh, that is something that sometimes lacks within organizations, mostly because the financial organization and the dev and, and uh, IT teams simply don't understand where each one is coming from. So we'll talk a little bit about how to start the, the cost-aware culture. And this is something that is well-known in the industry. And Folks like Amazon have, have really you know, doubled down on ensuring organizations focus on a cost aware culture. And then what are the benefits of rewarding those internal stakeholders for lowering costs? Uh, there's there's uh, a handful of benefits obviously from a PNL standpoint, but there's also some career opportunities there that a lot of organizations are taking advantage of coming out of that cost aware culture and driving uh, cost governance across the organizations. So some of the things that um, in cloud cost optimization that, that we often you know, hear as questions or just blanket statements or concerns is, is there a right balance between cost and OpEx to performance? So if I lower my OpEx, will that impact my performance? So the goal really is to lower OpEx, uh, make it easier, but not lose your performance, your scale, your ability to support customers and, and do development. Uh, you also want to look at, you know, eliminating mismanaged resources. Um, so things to think about as we have this conversation today are, are there things in, within your environments that you could lower, that you could remove temporarily or permanently that you simply just don't have a cadence around because of time and resources? Utilizing governance, um, especially in SaaS, to identify these resources is something that a lot of organizations will use today. So they there are several tools out there that, uh, even we uh, work with customers on um, around their uh, their cloud governance. So you can actually implement SaaS tools that will look at compliance around security and patching, uh, but also areas to potentially use uh, lower cost resources within cloud environments. So taking advantage of that on a 24 by seven basis versus putting a resource is much more advantageous. So there's there's a few things that we'll talk about there. Uh, moving additional um, cross-functional services um, across the ether. So 
as you know, COVID has come about and, and we're coming out of COVID, it really showed a lot of organizations that you know, the, the remote work requ requirement was there, but how do you secure that environment going back into your cloud resources? So zero trust networking, UC and security are additional areas that when you think of cloud optimization, a lot of organizations simply think of IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS environments from an infrastructure and, and software perspective, but the day-to-day -day plumbing that you know that you can think about whether you're calling a customer or utilizing um, you know video software and, and those types of things, how are you securing that in an environment? Because that can have impacts on your your opex. And the other thing to think about is predominantly staying away from multi-cloud. So some customers are like, what? Um, so doesn't necessarily mean to not go down to multi-cloud, but you really want to make sure as you go into a multi-cloud environment that you fully understand what the implications are. So if you're going to multi-cloud to just prevent you know, um, vendor lock-in or have diversity, really understand where that diversity and vendor lock-in could potentially lie because some of your cloud optimization could simply be uh, trying to prevent you know, something around deploying a multi-cloud environment where it's really not needed. So this is not to say multi-cloud is a bad thing, just really understand what multi-cloud means for your organization, because that is one area that a lot of organizations overspend in um, without really fully understanding what it means to go multi-cloud. Um, and then ultimately working across the aisle. So dev, IT, project management, product management, SRE teams to finance. So how do you take those technical teams that are, are trying to go in that agile environment, scaling applications, but balancing that back into finance and business, um, you know, to establish that cost aware culture. So some of the things that are blockers for everything that we just talked about is, is one of the biggest things is resources. So resources to focus on keeping cost in alignment is one of the largest areas that prevent co cloud cost optimization. Quite simply, the, the, the dev and, and, and technical IT teams, they don't have the time to sit and look for cost optimization. They, they're simply understaffed, sometimes overworked, trying to launch and build you know, uh, a, a seamless integration for your customers, for your organization. And you know, if, like we talked about multi-cloud, if they're tasked with now a, you know, a multi-cloud approach, whether they've got an app, app tier with one provider and a database tier with another provider, that's a lot of, a lot of time. And so the last thing that organizations typically focus on is how to lower my, my cloud bills. Uh, how do I lower my OPEX? And it's not done out of malice. It's just simply the, the resources. But the other thing too is in a lot of these, these, these dev teams and, and IT teams, their background isn't around driving costs. They're, they don't have a financial background by trade. So they simply look at, hey, I want to go build some really cool things. I want to go help my customers and help my organization. I'm not focused on the financial aspects of it. I'll stay within budget or I'll do my best, but that's somebody else's job. And it and it's not again done out of malice. It's just part of the culture that's always existed, you know, coming from these you know, these cloud native environments where it was, you know, speed to to market, right? Um, conversely, on the financial side, a lot of the the traditional financial um, executives and teams you know, over the last several years are still trying to get up to speed on what cloud means. Um, you know, a lot of them are, are very familiar with, again, the traditional IaaS environments, but when they when they actually receive the invoice or they see an invoice online and they see all these smaller charges for other things, they don't simply understand how that relates the expense to revenue. And they, you know, again, not out of malice, you know their their job is to to maintain the financial aspects of of the organization. So if they don't completely understand where, um, you know those investments that the dev teams are are making, how that's going to relate into an ROI back, it, it starts to you know kind of create a wall and a division between the two organizations um, by default. And and you know not having that technical aptitude um, by trade on the finance side, sometimes the finance teams you know they they feel like they're being left out or they or, or the industry is passing them and that's not the case. Um, the challenge is, is that, you know, if you think even 10 years ago where applications took months to deploy, now in these sprint cycles, it goes so quickly and it's addressing so many different areas. Therefore, things like security, 
and you know analytics and other things that are getting built in these cloud environments are going so quickly it's difficult for you know these finance teams to keep up it's no different than the tax code you wouldn't ask the the dev teams to to fully understand the US tax codes for example and that's why you have finance teams that, that that's their job so it's it's really you know trying to understand what the blockers are first versus just saying hey we're not getting along or we don't understand each other understand that they are blockers in every organization um, but what's interesting is we talk about that time. So we've pulled a lot of organizations. We've worked a lot of organizations around cloud optimization. 35% of the dev teams that we work with who have the ability to save 50% more in some sort of potential savings in their monthly spend around cloud, which is a, you know, kind of a, a looser term today, not just infrastructure, simply didn't do it. They didn't have the time or the resources to do that. Now, if the finance team fully understood that, that would probably cause bigger issues because they would say make the time. But uh, if you're if you're somebody on the dev side trying to to do your your daily role and your daily work streams, it's very difficult. And it just becomes, I'll just continue to pay. It's no different than you know if you have a cable bill at home, you know you could get savings this month. Your contract expired. You just haven't had the time to call in and reduce it by 20, 30 percent. It just comes down to time. So the biggest thing that everyone has recognized is that there are some opportunities, there's some blockers. And so out of this has come this new term, this new initiative called FinOps. So financial operations, and there's a lot of different definitions out here, but this is an industry focus now. And we see this becoming one of the, the next iterations within cloud as, as the maturity and the advancement across all verticals start to, to occur, many organizations are looking at building a FinOps focus within their, their organizations. And it basically, it's, it's taking the people and the process as it relates to the financial management and the cloud management and bringing the two organizations together to, to support your elastic environment, to, to have the ability to, to go up and down as, as quickly or, or as, as needed. So this is really needed for scoping of instances and impacts on the onset of what that might be for the future, uh, applied resources that begin to leverage a financial background in tech. So what you're gonna see is fi FinOps really is uh, a new direction, which is adding additional careers. Folks that have a financial background that understand technology or understand technology that start to build a financial background are now becoming the glue between that finance and, and dev organization. And for, for some organizations, it's you know something that's still new, they're still trying to define it. And that is something that you also wanna be cautious of because you certainly don't wanna go put a bunch of resources and not have it uh, generate positive results back in the organization. So we'll talk about um, a couple of things in the industry there. But the, at the end of the day, the whole goal is to remove the uh, fear or admonishment that folks feel may exist. So if I'm in finance and the, the, the tech teams don't understand me, or if I'm in the tech teams and finance, you know, don't understand where I'm spending, you know, our, our hard earned revenue, uh, the, the idea of FinOps is to, is to be the, the glue between those two organizations, to be able to speak both language figuratively and literally at times uh, to educate organizations because we've become such a cloud focused organization. So, FinOps is here and it's also taking charge. So this is, um, uh, I'm gonna show you a couple slides around some of some independent uh, statistics from the FinOps org. So you can go to finops.org. They're an independent organization made up by you know, some of the organizations that you may be working for today or, or know of, uh, but they've re realized that FinOps is something that's needed in this cloud world. It's, it's started Predominantly, I think, at least what we've seen in larger organizations, but now smaller organizations that are still early stage want to ensure that they are putting some sort of financial operation together because they know as they grow and scale, it's much easier to have that culture and that process in, in, invoked versus trying to retrofit like a lot of larger organizations have today. I won't go through everything here, but it is something that um, some of the big big organizations, big consulting organizations are, are noticing. So HCL, um, Accenture, KPMG, you know, they're building financial operations services to focus on this um, for some of these larger organizations. But the smaller organizations, you know, there's some things that 
you really want to start looking at is, you know, just getting an understanding of what the best practices are. And this is kind of how the, the FinOps org, you know, realizes that there's really three stages, crawl, walk, and run, you know, kind of a, a standard uh, uh, nomenclature for a lot of things in this world. But at the end of the day, you know, you, you're not going to be able to run and start, you know, creating this cost um, aware culture and cost savings, or at least, um, you know, cost advisement in the business day one. It takes time. And so if you are in the, the financial sector or have a financial responsibility, that is something that you have to understand. So as you start to deploy a FinOps environment, you may not necessarily see the results right away because you can you can see based on the statistics, you know, over 40% are still in that crawl phase and, and, and walk phase. So it'll take some time. Um, but understanding that, you know, this is, you know, something that is starting to come out and what, what, the, what, what this, you know, kind of, Focus has is kind of built some personas around this, and this is what I was talking about um, as it, as it relates to you know the whole cloud governance and cloud optimization um, industry. You know, within FinOps, um, we're, we're starting to see kind of these types of organizations um, look at building these personas. And again, this is again from from FinOps.org, so this is not a um, you know a, a mass TLC or, or a macronet kind of focus. This is something independent, but you can see that 43% um, are, are seeing that FinOps cloud management focus is, is, is coming and is needed. But on average, a lot of these organizations are starting to deploy upwards of seven people to focus on that glue, that kind of in between the financial and the dev uh, and IT teams around cloud. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the bottom, you know, the top um, personas, you know, kind of where they reported, 31% CTO and 26% CIO makes sense. But you're starting to see a double-digit focus within the CFO organization. Um, and, and we're starting to see, and we believe that that will continue to grow, not because, you know, the other C-level teams, you know, um, on the, you know, on the IT side can handle that. It's more of just, you know, based on that time, right? The CIO, CTO, they're focused on the delivery of the technical applications and environments for your customers and for your business. That CFO's organization is now looking at their team and saying, hey, how do I now con continue to build up my organization with a different focus? Instead of just having traditional you know, CPAs and finance backgrounds, maybe there is somebody that really likes numbers, really likes finance, but came from a technical background. That, you know, they they went to school to become a CPA and then they they got into technology. Or conversely, somebody that's just able to control their learning curve really understands the tech and how all of those investments are coming can, can overlay here. So one of the things that most organizations that have really rallied around FinOps is building a cloud center of excellence. It's essentially a centralized government uh, governance function and Gartner's defined this as well. So you'll start seeing this come out from Gartner uh, but basically, it's somebody that is, uh, or really a team that, you know, they have um, a focus on FinOps, but they don't have the day-to-day -day operational responsibilities. Think about, you know, the maintenance windows and the deployment schedules and the tweaking that goes on in these cloud environments. Your left brain is just focused on that all day long. But if your right brain has to focus on the FinOps side of it, it's very difficult to pull you in and out. So building the CCOE has representation from both organizations, both the finance and, and uh, IT teams, but having somebody that plays sort of, you know, figurative, you know, referee in the middle is something that's really important. And, and Gartner is recognizing that that is what's driving a successful cloud center of excellence. Um, the other thing that you'll notice up here too is um, kind of a shift from procurement. So you're seeing, you know, not as much in procurement in terms of those personas. So again, it's 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 really, um, you know, interesting that these are not going to be necessarily the folks that are just out there trying to solicit bids and try to drive costs without really fully understanding. Not that procurement does that, but that's where, um, you know, the, the persona is slightly different. So if you're on the IT side now, don't feel that this is just somebody in, you know, sitting in a in a in an office someplace, just trying to get you the lowest price or drive down costs without fully understanding it. The 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 persona is much much different. So, FinOps sounds great. Let's go do it. Let's go launch it. But what are the challenges? Um, Sixty one percent of the challenges today exist between engineering and finance. So you can look at you know, there's some things like container costs. You know, are driving some of the 
the challenges, you know, reducing waste or unused resources is, you know, 25% of that. So you've got a lot of QA and other, you know, dev environments that are just sitting idle, but not being utilized. There's a lot of opportunities to go fix that. Um, other things such as, you know, allocating um, cost resources to cost centers, those types of things. Okay, makes sense. But at the end of the day, kind of what we talked about at the beginning, building this FinOps and this cloud optimization focus really comes down to who's going to deal with the shared costs, getting engineers to take action, and building that within a, across the finance team. So if you look at, you know, the, the combined 61% is the challenge, again, between finance and engineering. They simply are not on the same same page. And it doesn't necessarily mean everything's going to be hunky-dory when you put in FinOps, everyone's going to rally around each other, it takes time, right, to get to that run stage. But if you're if you're building that environment and knowing up front that that's generally where things are, are challenged, you can go after that uh, day one. So, so the benefits of narrowing cloud costs within those internal stakeholders. So if we just think about, you know, between finance and, I, you know, and, and engineering in this case, um, is number one, you need to agree there needs to be cloud cost ownership. Right, so there, there definitely needs to be ownership um, between the two organizations, but but teaching them what that means. So your your goal here, as, as as you tee up cloud cost optimization, is you want to make sure that you're spending an investment into the finance organization, so they understand the ROI path. So if you're adding, you know, SaaS licenses and tools to better your customer experience and better your development environment, so you can scale faster. That's great, and you should, don't stop doing that. But somebody has to explain that to the finance organization on really what that is. It's no different than saying, well, we want to have the air conditioning on uh, for the month of June this year because of the you know, crazy temperatures that we've had. And what that will do is that will you know, make everyone feel comfortable in the office and you know, want to be here. So you explain that to the finance teams, and they understand it. Okay, yeah, we need... You know, we don't want to pay for it, but we can't not have this. It's no different uh, in, the, in, the, in the technical side. So when you're in cloud, you need to explain that to your CFO's office downward. They need to understand where these are going. doesn't necessarily mean they'll agree with you, you know, but think about it. They're not going to necessarily say, well, you've deployed a multi-cloud environment. You want an independent web application firewall to manage both in environments, do bot protection, all these other things. The CFO's office may not necessarily understand half of those things, but if you explain, hey, I'm trying to prevent, you know, uh, scraping of our data. I'm trying to prevent um, unauthorized access into our multi-cloud environment. I'm trying to prevent us from getting on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, like all these other things. If you can have somebody to articulate that, doesn't necessarily mean it has to be your, your engineering teams, but they have to be able to see that ROI path. So this is where you, you start to build that trust, but no different the, the the finance organization really needs to put that investment in to the IT organization, utilizing all of these assets and tools and resources that you are looking to budget for. Explaining that when you simply go and put something in, in line or you, you sign up for something else that we really didn't understand completely and it throws the PL off, here's the the impacts of what that does to our expenses down the line. So how do we try to manage, you know, the the supply and demand of resources? So, ex, you know, ex, let me explain to you. When we don't do that, this is how much more additional revenue we have to get. Or here's the the impacts of me not being able to um, uh, amateurize some of these things that I I could do in the past. Like I I understood how to amateurize hardware and software licenses. I'm I'm having some challenges now uh, being able to do this. Can we talk about it? So that's where it takes time, but you can see that there's a huge need for this. And I know that there's some folks probably listening to this today saying, this is exactly what we're going through, but I don't, I don't necessarily understand where to start. So the first thing that we find is creating that cost aware culture. And so it's very difficult to do by yourself at times because everyone knows the different organizations on either side. Uh, you know, we've worked with finance for this for this amount of time and years, and finance has worked this amount of time and years with the the engineering teams, and that can be a challenge because you, you kind of know how everybody works together, but you don't have something independent or someone independent. So we we always recommend, and, and this is one of the areas that 
we help in and there's a lot of other organizations it's just having somebody independent to proctor that it's it's kind of like the old days of, of building jad facilitated workshops of you know launching applications just having somebody talk through um the the journey that you're trying to build together to build this cost aware environment so you know really number one you want the the finance and the business organization understand your cloud concepts and and what future cloud concepts could be coming into the organization and what what is needed there um, cloud teams really need to understand as i mentioned the expense to revenue and other PL implications um, you know i've worked with many engineers throughout my career they're not too keen to, to really focus on the, the business side. They want to go build cool things and we don't want that to stop. But we also want them to understand, you know, just like when you launch certain applications, it has potential implications um, within your environment. When you do that, there's also another environment called, you know, the financial aspect of, of the organization. It does have some implications, good and bad, perhaps, but go find wins. So. If you're if you're starting this FinOps process, or maybe you don't officially do something within FinOps, but you're in the engineering side, if you're able to find some savings and some easy wins, you're able to shut off some resources or utilize, um, you know, less reserved um, and, and and less costly instances within cloud, are you know identify those savings and and bring that over to finance. Like you have to build that relationship. And it, and it sounds like, yeah, that's a no-brainer, Gary, but you'd be surprised how many organizations are not focused there, again, because of time. And, and, and the second one is it's just not part of their work stream, but make it part of your work stream. But if you're on the finance side, understand and recognize that olive branch that's coming into the organization. So if they are seriously finding ways to, to reduce cloud costs, then if you're in the finance organization, look for ways and other savings in the business that could then be reinvested back into the organization to that engineering organization. Ask the engineering team, hey, what are two things that you you could use that are not part of the budget for this year or the budget for this quarter? And, and try to find a small win there. Um, and then I think in, in, the, in the, the third thing that we, we typically um, advise on is, depending upon you know, your cloud environment, look for a cloud governance software, whether it's using you know, an orchestration uh, that can find savings in your environment, whether it's looking at, um, you know, things that are out of compliance or, you know, environments that aren't being used efficiently. So you can use the intelligence so you don't have to put the human capital in because, again, we mentioned time. Use that, that, that artificial intelligence to actually go out and find things that can help you lower your costs. So if you've got to pay X amount of dollars a month on a, on a SaaS tool, again, if you're on the engineering side, talk about what that will relate to in the potential ROI. So finance understands, hey, it's not just another shadow IT SaaS tool that's being being launched out there. And then, you know, kind of lastly, we've talked about, start that center of cloud excellence. You know, there's an opportunity within engineering and there's an opportunity within finance. There's There will be somebody on either side of that organization, potentially an individual contributor that you can then empower them to represent your organization uh, within this this um, CCOE. And why I bring that up is that's a great career path, teaches somebody some leadership um, opportunities, but it also starts to bring true awareness between the, the organizations um, and, and, and starts to build that cloud cost aware culture. So this is a great way for both organizations to quickly get up to speed on what's on the other sheet of paper for, for each organization. So benefits of building a cloud cost aware culture, we talked about um, prior experience. You know, a lot of them, uh, a lot of folks in, the, in these organizations, they, they're familiar with hardware and software. And, and how does that morph into cloud? So um, they're used to having all these fixed costs that's, that's changed or is, is continuing to change for some organizations. So this would allow them to appreciate the intricacies and cost nuances uh, to support all of these new environments. So if you're able to, to invest in your finance teams to explain really what, what these services are, really what these charges are, these expenses, and what that means, you know, as a the human element, you're you're putting some investment into them to help them better in their role long term. So that that is important. So if you're on the engineering side, take some time to build that relationship there. Also on the MA activity, so many of your organizations are buying organizations themselves. And one of the, the areas that are you know most often overlooked is 
how to really integrate the organization that you're purchasing into yours from a cloud perspective. Yeah, they look at, you know, okay, they have an Amazon instance, we have an Amazon instance, but how is the connectivity working between the two? How are our remote users connecting? Is there an opportunity to leverage some cost optimization as we acquire this organization? Well, it'd be great if the finance teams had a little bit better understanding of what that means and, and having that avenue within FinOps to have somebody bridge that between the technical side and the financial side. On the dev teams, you know, things to think about from a cost to work uh, perspective that I see um, organizations overlook that you could save immediately is data egress charges. Uh, a lot of organizations don't understand what a data egress charge really is as they're leaving or entering, or I should say, well, in this case, leaving cloud environments. Um, and then uh, obviously, you know, kind of what that departing uh, cloud environment looks like coming inbound into your new organization if you have multi-cloud. So probably should have specified that. But, but ultimately, um, understanding how data egress can have uh, quite a bit of expense creep without realizing it because you just think, hey, this is the way that I have to connect. There's multiple ways um, to lower that data egress charge um, across your environment that a lot of organizations don't understand because they're not network engineers by trade, right? They're, they're dev, they've built applications, they just assume, hey, here's how I connect. So that's an easy win for you to go and look at uh, your cloud expense to go back into finance and say, hey, you know, CFO team, uh, I just found us an extra X amount of dollars per month. You can expect that to have a run rate over the next 12 months. Super easy for you to uh, to take advantage of. Um, same thing with off-premise connections. So again, you know what's funny is you know this this world of network connectivity has changed quite a bit. But a lot of remote users, you still some of you still have data centers that need to connect. There's uh, a slew of ways to take those connections, especially for remote users and data centers. Now that we've had a lot of changes, you know, within COVID to look at lowering those costs because a lot of customers are still doing some traditional methods that are 30, 40% more expensive than other ways to, to connect cloud and multi-cloud uh, environments. And, and that includes, when I say multi-cloud, it could be your traditional IaaS connecting to other SaaS environments. Uh, it could be connecting to a completely different IaaS environment, but there are ways that are very easy that are also put into an elastic environment that you can go take advantage of. Uh, the other thing too is, you know, now with everything going on in this environment of cloud optimization, there there are a lot of outdated BCDR plans that exist today. So look at your RPO, RTO times. Are there ways that you haven't really looked at what that BCDR environment um, should be supporting? Uh, now that everything has gone more remote, have you updated that? Are, are you overpaying for BCDR plans within cloud that uh, really are not applicable anymore? A lot of organizations are taking a, a look at that. Um, we talked about, you know, appreciating the uh, the, the intricacies within finance. Um, you really want to just think about the the overall cloud spend that you have today, and what has that done over the last, say, 12 months, 24 months. And and certainly, it's most likely grown. It's gone up to the right. But why did it go up to the right? And and really being able to identify and articulate that back into finance. Hey, here's why. COVID hit. We had to to ramp up and and add additional uh, VM environments to support something in the business. However, there may be needs now where you've gone more cloud. Maybe cloud optimization may not necessarily be within just reducing the cloud spend. It could be the legacy applications that you had. Perhaps you don't need the, the the robust software defined WAN that you had at one point, or you know your your on premise environments of you know your phone PBX, um, audio visual, other things may not necessarily be needed because you've reduced your office footprint, or folks don't necessarily need to route to applications there because they're routing to the cloud. So cloud optimization can also impact kind of that lower hanging fruit, non strategic legacy environments. Uh, which you can then take and, and work with your counterparts if you're not responsible for that, take that back into finance as well. So one of the areas that um, I do talk to customers about 
often is the AWS Well-Architected Framework. So many of you are probably very familiar with the AWS Well-Architected Framework. It's essentially a credo, a white paper, uh, very in-depth that talks about essentially architectural best practices working within AWS. There's five pillars, and most organizations today are familiar with, I'd say, the top four. You'll notice at the bottom, very bottom, one highlighted in red is cost optimization. And that is one that Amazon is continuing to invest in. But I bring it up, uh, you know, all the, the, the major IS providers want you to reduce your OPEX as much as possible. But when you think about cost optimization and, and one of the largest and, and obviously the, the number one cloud providers out there today that's coming back to you saying, hey, you do need to think about cost optimization, it is written. And I bring this up because if you are neither one of those teams, finance teams, or if you're on the, the engineering side, Amazon's coming out and saying, you need to think about a cost aware culture. You need to think about cloud cost optimization. So if one of the other organizations that you know, you're struggling with to try to convince around cost optimization, uh, AWS is, is kind of independently said, hey, listen, you need to go, go think about this. So there's links here. Uh, we'll, we'll get this deck out to you as well. But you can click on the, the cost optimization link and it, and it talks about building a cost aware culture and things to do. Um, the, the things that, um, that it won't necessarily specifically explain to you is here is exactly how to take your application and change to, to, to reduce your cloud spend. Or here's exactly the five things you need to go do to lower your AWS bill. They'll kind of talk about a, a few things and, and, and it's really up to you on the engineering side to take advantage of that because the finance teams, they don't have that ability to go make those changes. No differently that you don't have the ability to go impact how you know um, the balance sheet and statement of cash flow will will look or or be impacted uh, from a finance perspective. So finance is looking at you to say, okay, how do you go build this cost aware culture? You know, part of it starts with you. Some things that we'll just talk quickly about AWS and some things that you could potentially go in uh, within your environment today to take advantage uh, of lowering some of your your costs. And there's a lot of other ways to do it. Every organization has its own use case. So what I tell you today may be slightly different uh, to your organization, but what you'll find is, is that AWS is coming out with more um, statements, more tools, so you can manage your environment and your cloud spend a little bit more efficiently. However, let's not forget what I talked about earlier. Many organizations simply do not have the ability to go and have somebody uh, focus on this on a daily basis. So if you uh, like all of these things, but you don't have the time, again, that could be an opportunity for a FinOps position. So AWS, there's some tools in the tool shed. They have their AWS Cost Explorer, so you can actually um, look at, you know, kind of what's what's there. You can see some great graphs. Here's here's an example of, you know, kind of a, a I'd say almost a historical spend and and what the usage is. Um, you know, kind of think about what you can turn off, what you can turn on. Um, I mentioned the, you know, understanding the egress data charges. So, you know, do you want to have an internet VPN connection or direct SD-WAN uh, connection into the AWS environment? Those have different charges uh, and, and obviously potential tax implications. So if, again, if you're an engineer and you're using a traditional carrier, you may not understand how you're connecting into AWS may actually have tax implications that you're unaware of that certainly the finance team will 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 know. Uh, the other thing uh, we always talk about is leveraging savings plans within AWS. So many of you use that, many of you don't. Uh, so you definitely wanna leverage savings plans. Um, we have a ton of information around that. And then the last one that we always focus on is utilizing spot instances uh, within AWS and typically with an orchestrator. The reason why we like spot is if, and if you're new to Spot, um, it's it's an environment. You know, it, it's basically uh, resources that are that are available out there today that nobody's using. That Amazon will lower up to maybe 90% of the traditional you know on-demand uh, charges. Uh, that's just it, it essentially uh, excess capacity. Why I bring that up is many organizations don't leverage Spot. 
uh, or they'll leverage spot manually. They'll say, hey, I just found that you know this instance is available or this, uh, this spot instance is available for 90% off. I'll swing my environment over for the next hour. Uh, I'll watch and wait for it. Once it's getting ready to expire, I'll move it back. That's great. But utilizing a spot orchestrator is really powerful because it essentially acts as a day trader. It's looking for spot instances on a 24 by seven basis. So you don't have to put a resource on this. And what it's doing is it's looking for the ability to take your application and move it to spot. And before spot expires, because it's not permanent, it might mean that somebody or even Amazon themselves needs to pull that those resources back uh, but it does give you time. It'll then gracefully move your or, um, your application back into you know your reserved or on-demand environment. Why that's important is we see upwards of a 50% monthly reduction in EC2 when using an orchestrator for this. Now, a lot of organizations are like, "Great, this is great. I don't have time. You need to find time because this is something that can be installed in 10 minutes. You can tag your resources within EC2." and gracefully move those in and out. Why I bring this up is it, it's really good for auto scaling, beanstalk, container environments. You saw the container uh, cost charge that the FinOps had kind of identified. It wasn't a lot, but it was around, I think around 7%. But if you start finding some easy wins, you can take this back to the finance organization and say, hey, I found a way for us to lower some of our EC2 costs immediately. And that is something that if you were to proactively go to the finance organization, it's a great way to build that that trust and that ability that you are looking out for the business. Um, and, and basically what we find within EC2 is that there's usually some sort of spot market available. Um, it's great you know, to even just test with QA environments. If you don't want to put production on there, put your QA environment into one of these spot orchestrators. It'll start moving those things back and forth. And if for some reason, um, you know, you you still are unsure, at least put everything that's non-production in there to take that off the table. So it's a very easy way from a cloud optimization standpoint to lower your Amazon spend. And what we usually see, um, this is an example uh, in a, you know, typical, you know, kind of um, M5 large environment, you know, we'll just say with 70% reserved um, for the first year, you know, basically your charge is going to be 27 grand a month. If it was on demand, it's 19 grand a month. If you're using spot, it's nothing because, you know, you're essentially just keeping it in that static environment. So your total costs around 47 grand a month. So that's a pretty big environment. Some of you have much larger environments. We work with some customers that are spending two, 300 grand a month in EC2 and some that are just spending five grand a month. But with a spot orchestrator that's consistently in and on a daily basis, looking for environments in spot that can take those environments up top and move it to spot gracefully in and out. So again, spot does expire. It may last for an hour. It could last for three hours, but it, Amazon will tell you when it expires. So when it does it get ready to expire, it moves it back. And usually what you're able to do is reduce that cost significantly. So now, um, you know, you're looking at, you know, upwards of, almost $24,000 a month in savings. So it's over 50%. The cost to do this with some of these spot orchestrators is they're typically gonna take 10% of the published on-demand rate. So you know we work with some some partners there and and that's good because you know what your kind of your fixed rate is, but if it doesn't find any savings, it doesn't cost you anything. So again, if you go to finance and you say, hey, listen, we're trying to build this cost-aware environment. I think I have a tool that can just take our EC2 spend and just you know, kind of change some things around. Um, I can go put this in line and we're gonna give it a try. This is something that has been really successful for customers, lowering EC2 spend by 50, sometimes 70% a month. Um, that's, a, that's a real win. So one good, really good example to, to lower your cloud, cloud savings in an um, optimized environment. So in closing, I just wanted to throw out some resources. I mentioned, uh, you know, some of the cost optimization, egress charges, uh, spot orchestration. We've got some, you know, published free articles. Feel free to take a look at um, FinOps Org. I think this is a really good organization. Uh, there's a governing board that kind of, you know, talks and focuses specifically on 
cloud optimization and, and this new wave of really individuals and career paths for folks to, to kind of be the glue between finance and engineering. And you can actually see the, the state of the FinOps report that I posted. I think it's a really good um, overview and, and hopefully you can take it and use that within your organization, regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, to talk about how, how everybody else is moving this path. How do we start to look at building that you know, cloud circle of excellence and, and other things in the organization? And then from an AWS perspective, the well-architected framework, the cost optimization pillar, it's it's written, it's it's out there. So you don't have to necessarily go recre recreate the wheel. Um, certainly every organization has a different environment, different need to, to, to lower savings. Uh, but let Amazon, you know, kind of help you, you know, structure that. And you can you can build a cost aware environment no matter which cloud provider you use. Um, but AWS is is obviously published that. So Hopefully you found this really interesting today. It's just the tip of the iceberg around cloud optimization. Uh, we can go on for hours, but you'll start to see more of this come across the industry and hopefully uh, you can take a, a few nuggets back to your organization and start saving and start building that cloud cost aware culture. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And thank you to the tech and innovation community sponsors, Chewy, Intersystems, Macronet, MIT Professional Education in Progress, and to the MassTLC Global Sponsors.